Association. A few months ago, we were honored to be in Jerusalem, Israel. Yeah. We had about 150. How many of you were in Jerusalem at the Empire? Stand up, stand up. We want to say thank you. You guys were awesome. Give our students a hand. They were the best PR we could have. It was an amazing week. 4,500 people from 70 nations around the world at the Empower 21 Global Congress. And during that Congress, we took a moment on the last night to honor some fathers and mothers of the faith. It was a very special moment. Uh, people like Vincent Sinan, who serves on our board of trustees, Jack Hayford, Morris Cirillo, Marilyn Hickey, who is a long-term chair of the Board of Regents here at ORU, and others. And there was one gentleman that we planned on honoring that night who at the last minute could not be in Jerusalem with us. So we thought about giving it to someone on his team who happens to be with him here tonight. We said, no, let's wait for a more appropriate moment. And we think tonight is the appropriate moment. Would you turn your eyes to the screen? Reinhard Bonnke was born and ordained in Germany, but it was in Lesotho, Africa, that God placed a vision of the continent of Africa being washed in the precious blood of Jesus. His tent meetings grew rapidly. In 1984, he commissioned the world's largest tent. Soon, it wasn't large enough to hold the crowds. Since then, citywide meetings have grown, attracting crowds as large as 1.6 million people. No bishop can save us. No pastor in the last 40 years, Christ for All Nations has held crusades in 91 countries around the world. The total salvation decision count has exceeded 73 million souls. Reinhard Bonnke continues to lead evangelistic crusades, make inspirational films, and hold fire conferences for church leaders. This book is not here to condemn us. God has given his word to save us. For tireless service in Holy Spirit evangelism, Empower 21 is proud to present the Lifetime Global Impact Award to Reinhard Bonnke. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Reinhard Bonnke. Just remain standing. Sure, sure. Reinhard, it gives me great pleasure tonight that on behalf of spirit-filled Christians around the world and the Empowered 21 Global Network, to present you this award tonight, this is the Lifetime Global Impact Award. Let me say to you this evening in this room, without apology, I would say the most fruitful evangelist in the history of Christianity is standing with us on this stage tonight. <laughs> Reinhardt, we love you. And... Remember, we were in Jerusalem, and for many years, you have trumpeted the gospel around the world. It's very fitting on our 50th anniversary, our Jubilee moment, to present you with this shofar and say, keep on sounding the trumpet for Jesus. Amen. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Reinhard Bonnke. Just stay on your feet, and Reinhardt is going to preach until you are delivered tonight. Amen. Come on, Reinhardt, preach. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for the sofa. I can only tell you one thing. My gospel trumpet doesn't have a sticky valve. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Dr. Wilson, for this honor. I feel deeply honored, and I receive it in the name of the one 
who has said, without me, you can do nothing. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Because to him be all the glory and all the praise. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Amen. Can I ask sound control to give me a little bit more monitor, please? Because uh, if I don't have more monitor, I start shouting. <laughs> or Roberts University. 51 years ago, I met Oral Roberts in Germany, the city of Frankfurt. And uh, they were talking about the university. I just had graduated from college, but I was asked if I wouldn't want to become a student at ORU. 51 years ago, I declined because I was already on my way to Africa. And I have no regrets. <laughs> because God has done mighty, mighty, mighty things. Congratulations, ORU. And President Wilson and everyone here, I, I must say this is a very, very special juncture in the history of ORU. Um, you know what came to my heart when I thought of this evening? We see all the wonderful, um, what shall I say, buildings of ORU, the praying hands of Oral Roberts. And that's all wonderful. But actually, I see something far greater. And I think something much more valuable. In Psalm 133, we read of Aaron how he was anointed with oil. And one day when I read it, it struck me. Aaron, after having had this abundant anointing, remember, the oil was flowing down his head, his beard, his garments, and right down to his feet. I believe he he was so powerfully anointed that that anointing oil dropped on the ground. When Aaron had gone back into his house, or tent rather, people afterwards saw his footsteps and said, the anointed of the Lord walked past here, can you see the oil in those footsteps? I see Oral Roberts' anointed footsteps. And I see a host of other footsteps of men and women that have come from here who went to the ends of the earth anointed powerfully and mightily by the Holy Spirit. And may this be the highest price for our lives. When I was a young man, I, I visited Westminster Abbey in London. And I saw the tombstone of John Wesley. I read the inscription and I never forgot it. I read, God buries his workers, but his work carries on. And here we are in Jesus' name. We carry on, anointed by the Lord, 
in Jesus' name. Are you happy? Praise God. Praise God. I'm honored to be here today to speak to you. I love you all. Uh, I love people. I'm an evangelist, you know. That's what I have in common with Oral Roberts. I preach the ABC of the gospel. I don't apologize for that. It doesn't mean that I don't know the XYZ. I actually do. But when I preach the gospel, I want to preach it to be understood by people who need to enter through the narrow gate into the kingdom of God. Amen. And that's where the ABC has got to be preached. Praise be to God. I just want to share my heart with you here tonight. Is that okay? Yeah. Praise God. The theme, my theme right now is Jesus is alive. Let's shout it together. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me read from Mark chapter 15, from verse 3 to 45. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body of Jesus to Joseph. Joseph was a secret believer. He was a highly learned man from the place called Arimathea. But when Jesus died, that secret love broke open. He went to Pilate, a very bold move. The Roman governor and asked for the body of Jesus for the purpose of burial. Pilate was surprised. He couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. Because I've read it in secular history books that sometimes it took two weeks for a person to die the death of crucifixion. Jesus only hung six hours on the cross from nine o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. Six hours. After six hours, he had died. God created the world in six days. He saved us in six hours. <laughs> That's something. I thought, I thought it all connects. It all connects. So Pilate thought this was, this was a scam. Somebody wanted to get hold of Jesus and, 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 and then revive him and then all these sort of things. I come to the point. Pilate called a chief centurion and said, you go to the cross and find out whether this Jesus is really dead. That, I think, was the soldier who went there with his spear in the hand and thrust it into the side of Jesus. Blood and water flowed out separately. We read a sure sign of death. The centurion went back and said, Yes, governor, Jesus is truly dead. I am a witness. Now it comes. When Pilate heard that Jesus was truly dead, he smiled. 
And he said, Joseph, with the compliments of Caesar in Rome, here you have your Jesus for burial. And suddenly it struck me. Why did Pilate give Jesus to Joseph? He gave him because he knew that Jesus was dead. Pilate was not afraid of a dead Jesus because he knew a dead Jesus is a useless Jesus. A dead Jesus is a harmless Jesus. A dead Jesus could no more heal the sick and cast out demons and walk on the water and raise the dead. A dead Jesus would be absolutely neutralized. And that's why he gave Jesus, he gave Jesus to Joseph. And I think the devil is doing the same today. He gives a dead Jesus. He doesn't mind people to have a dead Jesus or a dead church or a dead who knows what. With the compliments of the emperor. Here you have him. Well, I've got good news for you. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior. We sing that wonderful song. I heard it sing in the Royal Albert Hall when I preached there. And I thought, the British sang it so fantastically. I thought I heard, I heard the angels sing and heaven echo. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. Yes, Jesus is alive. I, years ago, I befriended a shopkeeper. I was his customer. I think he was an Indian gentleman. We talked, I talked to him about Jesus and he talked to me about his religion. Again and again. And one day he said to me, I'm on my way. On the pilgrimage, I want to see the grave of the founder of my religion. I said to him, have a good look. And when you come back, tell me what you saw. He went. When he came back, I saw him. He was so happy to see me. He was glowing. I said, what did you see? He said, that grave was so beautiful. Oh, it was decked with gold and silver and precious stones. So beautiful. He kept speaking about the beautiful grave of the founder of his religion. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart. And you know what he said? The most beautiful thing about the grave of Jesus is that it is empty. <laughs> Jesus is alive. Keep your gold and keep your silver. My Jesus is alive. Amen. Bury a lie and it will rot. Bury the truth 
and it will rise. That is why the grave could not hold Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Are you happy? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, let me say something foolish. Nobody has ever written a book to prove that Reinhard Bonnke is alive. And I'll tell you why. Because living people tend to show up. <laughs> it's not necessary to prove anything. And because Jesus is alive, he's showing up right here and right now. He's, he's here. He's here. Took years for me to understand that. For years, my, my prayer was, oh Lord, please come be with me. Come into our midst. And then one day I woke up and I said, I think only somebody not right in his head is asking for someone to please come who never left you. Jesus is alive and Jesus is present. Yes, if you can afford to shout hallelujah, then do it now. I love you. I really do. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In April 1975, in Africa, I had my first gospel crusade. I rented a stadium for the first time because the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I should rent the stadium. I said, Lord, are you sure? I said, Lord, I always wanted to preach in the stadium, but the people never came. But if you say I am to preach in that stadium, I will preach in that stadium. Four weeks later, I arrived for my crusade. I had fasted and prayed, put the tiny little team together. I called it Christ for all nations. And then I said, oh Lord, I only have one church cooperating with 40 people. <laughs> I arrived, the first meeting, there were 100, I know for sure because I counted 10 times. <laughs> 100, if 100 are 100, no matter if how you count, back to front or front to back, they are 100 if you count the heads and not the fingers. Some are finger counters. I was not happy, only 100 people but I took my Bible and I started to preach. I had preached about 10, 10, 20 minutes when suddenly somebody over there started to scream, scream. I've just been healed. Another one, another one, another one. I've just been healed. I thought that's funny. <laughs> I didn't even preach about healing. And how come these people interrupt my sermon? <laughs> I learned my first lesson. And the lesson is this one. I believe oftentimes Jesus can't wait until we preachers are finished with our boring sermons. He is alive and he itches to do miracles. Amen. 
That night, a blind woman received her sight and the cripple walked. And a few days later, the stadium was packed. Jesus is alive. He shows up. He is here. We don't celebrate religion. We celebrate the living Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's alive. I've been thinking of Mary Magdalene. The Bible says she was the woman that was possessed by seven devils. Then she met Jesus and Jesus cast them all out. And it was, and it was that Mary who was first at the grave. Read the story again and we read that she was trembling, crying. And I wonder why. Mary was an intelligent woman, and this is what struck her. If Jesus, the Jesus who is my Savior, and the Jesus who cast out all seven devils from me, if this Jesus is dead, it can only mean the devils will come back to me. That's why she trembled when suddenly she heard a voice, Mary. <laughs> she shot around. Her eyes could not recognize him because they were cried red. But what her eyes didn't see, her ears picked up. This was my Jesus. She cried and shouted, Rabboni! I would say she shouted, Jesus! As long as you live, no devil can come back to me. As long as you live, I remain a child of God. Nothing can separate me from his love. And in Revelation, Jesus opened his arms and said, Behold, I was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. That's true for all of us. Come on, what do you say? Amen. 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 Now, my next point is this the church has too often trusted scholarship, genius, logic, philosophy, plus, plus, plus. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27 that God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. The apostles did not preach logic. They preached the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. If you shoot a dead man with a gun of the gospel, he becomes alive. <laughs> that is the power of the gospel. Amen. I heard some preachers say, God bless them. I heard them say that we preachers have got to have got to be like lawyers in court. We argue. We argue the case of Jesus to get a verdict in favor of him. 
What? <laughs> but that is human wisdom only. That is human wisdom only. Jesus needs no defending. I'll tell you more. You don't need to defend a lion. Just open its cage. <laughs> it can look after itself. And Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has prevailed. He is alive. Jesus is alive. No. His repute is beyond any jury. He's not the defendant. He's not in the dock. He's going to be the judge of all the earth. And we better get used to that. Yeah. Say amen. amen. Well, hear me out. We are not called, when it comes to preach the gospel, we are not called to be lawyers, attorneys, or barristers. We are called, according to Acts 1 verse 8, to be witnesses. Jesus said, you are my witnesses. Do you hear me? We are witnesses. We are witnesses of his resurrection. We are witnesses. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Now, let me go a step further. Um, normally, a witness just tells what he has seen or what he has experienced. That's a witness. He doesn't give speeches. He doesn't debate. He doesn't do anything but say what he has seen, what he has experienced. But sometimes it's slightly different. For instance, if somebody has been attacked by a thug and badly injured, now the court case is on. There's the defendant. Here is the one who accuses him. And what does he do? He takes off his shirt. He turns around and he says, these scars were inflicted by the defendant. In other words, the witness becomes a living piece of evidence. And I tell you, a living Jesus needs living witnesses. I want to be a living piece of evidence that Jesus is alive. He is the savior of the world. He is the healer of the sick. He's here to break all bondage. He breaks every chain, even the chain in the brain. Yeah. Hallelujah! What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Can I tell you a little story? I experienced this myself. I actually have already told it here and there, but never here, so... You are all right. <laughs> I was invited to come on state television for a discussion. They said uh, uh, experts uh, were discussing religious questions. I don't know how they came to me, but they picked me 
And actually, I'm someone who likes a good fight. <laughs> I, a good fight. And then one day I arrived there at television house and there were other panel members I had never seen before. There was the moderator, I knew him. We were hardly on the air when a gentleman exactly opposite of me who had told us that he was an atheist charged me. He said to me, preacher, you preach that there's power in the blood of Jesus. He said, I said, yes, I do. He said, I don't believe it. I said, why don't you believe it? He said, the blood of Jesus is already 2,000 years in this world. Yet, the world today is worse than it was 2,000 years ago. That's why I conclude there is no power in the blood of Jesus. I said, wait. You know, it's amazing. My mind works in pictures. I said, mister, there's also a lot of soap in this world, yet many people are still dirty. I said, I would like to explain to you how soap works. <laughs> I said, if I am dirty and I stand next to a piece of soap, I am not automatically clean. I said, I'm not even automatically clean even if I should work in a soap factory. If, mister, you want to know what soap can do? You've got to stretch out your hand. Take the soap. And apply it. Then you will know what soap can do. And so is the blood of Jesus. I said, it's not enough to know about soap or hear about the blood of Jesus or sing about the blood of Jesus. But if you apply the blood of Jesus to your sinful life, mister, I said to him, the next moment you will jump to your feet, you will throw up your arms, you will shout, you will sing, you will say, there's power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lord. Hey. The atheist looked at me with big eyes. He said to me, Bonky, when you speak, I was all live on TV. He said, when you speak, I feel something is emanating from you. <laughs> he said, I spoke with some other evangelists, but I never felt that. I said, he said, I thought, what could the difference be between them and you? And I think I have the answer. He said, the others were amateurs, and you are a professional. <laughs> I said, mister, you are wrong again. <laughs> and now I come to my point here. I said, mister, I tell you what I am. I am a living piece of evidence that there is power in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey. I 
I come from Germany and the German people say I am too noisy, I shout too much. <laughs> you know what I told them? I say when I see how Satan binds people with chains, with fears, with tears, with depression, oh, when I see how he binds them with drug addiction and alcoholism and all those things, I cannot purr like a cat. I want to roar like a lion. Let the whole world hear it, Jesus says. Amen. I hope you realize that I enjoy myself. What an honor to preach the gospel. What an honor honor what an honor now I, I must tell you the end of the story of my atheist <laughs> after the show I went to the parking lot wanting to go home suddenly somebody tapped me from behind I looked around who was it my atheist and although we were all alone there on that huge parking lot, he whispered into my ear, Bonky, will you pray for me? <laughs> Jesus is alive! Jesus is alive! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Quickly. Next thing, a living Christ demands a living church. You know, we have got this picture of Jesus and the church. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride. He is the head, we are the body. I heard somebody say he prefers the picture of Christ being the head and the, we are the body because a bridegroom can still run away from the bride, but the head not from the body. <laughs> I think that was a good observation. <laughs> he said, I will never leave you. I will never divorce you. I'm with you always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, if he is our living head, you cannot put the living head on a corpse. How's that going to go? Somebody said to me, I'm in a half-dead church. What? <laughs> the living head would not be satisfied with that. May his resurrection power and the power of the Holy Spirit flow through us all. Here we are in Jesus' name. Living pieces of evidence. I know that my Redeemer lives. Deadness is sin. Huh. I read about, I read about those uh, church oils, masters, that are hanging in all these mostly traditional churches. And over hundreds of years, experts came to enhance the master's picture. And they put a coat of varnish over it to protect it. A hundred years later, another expert. Another coat of varnish. And then yet another coat of varnish until all these masters looked so 
solemn, so darkish. And they thought that was the way the masters had painted them. And after they discovered that these were layers of varnish, they stripped one layer after another and they came to the original painting which was brilliant in color. I believe, I believe that nowadays Christians suffer from layers and layers of unbelief that were painted over us. So many theories and theologies of unbelief have, have cheated us out of the simplicity which is in Christ. Let's put our trust in Jesus. The original, he is alive, he's here, and he works. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. That is faith. There's no comfort in unbelief. Actually, I would go as far as saying, Unbelief is judgment. There's no comfort in unbelief. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Jesus said to that woman, Fear not, only believe. Only believe. I always thought at first the emphasis is on belief. Suddenly I realized the emphasis is as much on only as it is on belief. Believing is not complicated. Believing is receiving from Jesus. Jesus said, only believe because everybody can believe. We were all born with a measure of faith. Only. If you are hungry, only eat. Any problem? <laughs> if you are thirsty, only drink. If you are tired, only sleep, but not now. <laughs> and if you want to see the risen Christ in action, he opens his arms and he says to you, I did all for you. You only believe. Come on, only believe. Lord, I believe. I never finish that verse. I never say, Lord, help my unbelief. You know why? Because my unbelief needs no help. <laughs> I want my unbelief to die. I want my faith to live. Jesus is alive. A living Jesus demands a living church. <clears throat> Praise be to God. I've got one more point. Are you sleepy? No. Okay. I'll just make sure. <laughs> a living Jesus also demands living ministries. Living ministries. Numbers chapter 7 verse 8, it's an Old Testament picture. How the leaders of the 12 tribes or 11 tribes rebelled against Moses. Moses was, uh, Aaron was the high priest chosen by Moses. And they said, this is family business. We are in the same position. We are leaders of a tribe. 
each. We want to have the privileged position that Aaron has. And there was great, great consternation. Moses cried to God, and this is what the Lord said. I like that. He said, everyone, leader of the tribe, of all 12 tribes, should come with a tree branch, a tree branch, and put it in the tabernacle. And everyone write their name on it. Was personalized. I believe that branch was, was a symbol of their ministry or our ministry. Personalized ministry. Your name is on your ministry. My name is on my ministry. We can't separate it. We can't. And the Lord said in the morning, you will go into the tabernacle and then you will inspect those 12 branches. And the one that has budded, blossomed, and bears fruit, check the name. He is the one I have chosen. And when they did it, they found of all 12 branches, rods, Aaron's was alive, was full of life, blossoms, leaves, fruit, even fruit. That solved the problem. But here we are. What do we desire? A rod of gold? Golden ministry? Golden rod? Golden baton, if I may say so? Silver tongue? Preaching that people say, oh, for admiration. Well, I'm not against gold and silver, as I already said. But let's face facts. Gold and silver are dead. Yeah. Although they are beautiful. I desire a ministry pulsating with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I desire a ministry where I see the power of God demonstrated. I desire to be a living piece of evidence to the whole wide world that Jesus is alive, that he saves, that he fills with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is really what I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me here today. The Lord has to give past batons to you. I'm now 75 years old. I don't dye my hair. If I wanted my hair white, I would have to dye it white. <laughs> my wife dies, and I keep on living. <laughs> Sorry. That was a joke. <laughs> but the truth is, I said to her, honey, please wait for me. She's waiting and waiting. So she keeps dying and dying. Never mind. <laughs> she loves it anyway. I have a wonderful wife. The point is this. 
I pass the baton of Christ for All Nations to Daniel Colenda. He's here. Stand up. Amen. And God is using him as he used me. It's, it's, it's a budding rod. It's a budding rod. It's not something that pleases people. Just the dead stuff. Jesus is alive. And we must be alive. Our ministry. Our ministry must be alive. Like that atheist said, he could feel something emanating. Rivers of living waters shall flow from our innermost being. We have fruit, we have blossoms, we have leaves. We are planted by the river, by the hand of God. I pray that everybody gets that living baton and runs with it and preaches the gospel. Every non-God operation one day will become dust. But he who does the will of God abides forever. I said to my father when I was just a teenager, I had already the Holy Spirit. My father said, Reinhard, what do you want to do with your life? My brother wanted to become a medical doctor. He became a medical doctor. The other a scientist. He became a scientist. And suddenly I was confronted. What do I want to do with my life? And it struck me. And it's true until today. I said, Dad, I want to do something with my hands that is eternal. I want to build the kingdom of God. No bombs can destroy it. No time can just gnaw it away. God's kingdom is from everlasting to everlasting. And in case there's another everlasting to another everlasting. I want my hands to build God's eternal kingdom. I want to carry that baton of the gospel from nation to nation to nation. And I want my lips to preach the eternal gospel. It's all eternal. It's all timeless. Death can, us, can do us no harm. Isn't that something fantastic? Isn't it something fantastic? Glory to God. In Africa, we kept records on how many people got saved. Since 1987, it was Vincent Sinan who told us to start with making proper records. From then until now, 74 million people completed the decision card for salvation who partook in our, physically, in our gospel crusades. Isn't that fantastic? Do you really think they are all born again? No, 
I can't tell you, but I'll tell you what. As long as it, is, as it is written in the Bible, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are doing something right. My prayer for all are you is this, that this university may become a fertile womb for the next Holy Spirit, next generation of Holy Spirit evangelists. That's what I believe. May God help us to build his eternal kingdom. I believe also, and this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me, that America will be saved. Yeah. I lived in Vero Beach in Florida. Tiny little place. I read then it has 14 thousand inhabitants one day the Lord spoke to me and said I want you to have a crusade in Vero Beach I said a crusade I said Lord are you serious he said I'm very serious he said okay okay I'm sorry I'll do whatever you say I learned that in the meantime When the crusade came, I had 5,000 people in every service in that tiny place. It was as if somebody shot a flare into the night sky. I saw all of America illuminated. And I said, I heard the Lord say, America will be saved. This is, not, this is not just something that is glibly said. I believe it's God's program. I want to identify with this program. And I believe that is also the heart of the purpose of ORU. America shall be saved. America will be saved. When God told me that Africa will be saved, my own missionary colleagues said, Reinhard, you are crazy. You are crazy. Let's talk about Lesotho. Here where we are now, missionaries. I said to them, you talk about Lesotho. I hear the Holy Spirit speak about Africa. I no more want to make my own agenda for God. I now join God's agenda. And he said, Africa shall be saved. My branch, that rod, became alive. I carried the gospel from nation to nation to nation. Over a period of 10 years, 55 million people present in our meetings completed a decision card for salvation and were referred to a cooperating church. 55 in 10 years. I was in Switzerland and I told them what God had done in Africa. Afterwards, Swiss pastors met me and they said, Brother Bunke, that is Africa. This is Switzerland. I said, but you are contradicting scripture. They said, which one? I said, John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world. Now you Swiss have got to tell me whether Switzerland is part of that world. And you know what, I, what else I said? I said, 
if God can save 55 million in Africa in 10 years, he can save Switzerland one Saturday afternoon. Let's not home in on the shiny stuff. Let's get that living rod in Jesus' name. And the Lord spoke to me when I prayed in my hotel room this afternoon. He said he is giving rods, a rod to everyone. Your name is on it. You will carry it. As you go from nation to nation, to nation to nation, I dug out the trumpets that brought down the walls of Jericho. I cleaned them up. I repaired them. And now I want to blow faith from city to city, from state to state, from coast to coast. America will be saved. I've seen him, what he did in Africa. He is the same God right here. He will do it through you. This is my question right at the end. Who is here this evening? Who wants to say, Lord, I want that budding branch. I write my name on it. But you've got to give it life. You've got to fill it with life. I want to go like a flame of fire burn through every barrier. Cast out every devil. Set the captives free! In Jesus' name. Anyone who wants that rod, that ministry of life, that ministry of the Holy Spirit, you want to lift it up to God, then I want you to stand with me and lift it up symbolically with your hands uplifted to God. In Jesus' mighty name, come on, lift your hands up in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. I want you to speak to him. Come on. We know how to speak. We all can say, Lord, here is my branch. Here is my rod. I want more than shiny stuff. I want that anointing that breaks the yoke. I will run with this button. Run with this branch. And bring salvation to the nations. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you may now touch all these branches that have been presented to you. And they will go in the power of your might, O Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And if you mean it, shout a mighty amen. Yeah. Amen! You may sit one more time. I'm an evangelist. I told you I don't apologize. I, I, I can't go like this. You heard me what I said about the blood of Jesus. That it washes us from all our sin. But you need to stretch out your hand. Take it. And apply it. And you will leave this auditorium. A new creature. And I counted a great honor 
to pray for you, with you. Because Jesus is here to do it. Let's close. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. If somebody's here who says, Oh Lord, I desperately need to be washed from sin by the power of the blood of Jesus. I want to stretch out my hand to you. I lift it up to you and say, Lord, I now apply it to my own sinful life. And you will go home a new creation in Christ Jesus if you do it. Please, if you want cleansing from sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, I would love to pray for you. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, praise God, praise God. I see on the balcony, God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here to my right, let Jesus see your hand. Stretch it out to get hold of the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I would like... It's just the way it is done. I did it myself when I came to receive Jesus into my life. And tonight it's your turn. I want everyone to stand to their feet. And those who really mean it, that they want to be washed from sin by the precious blood of Jesus, please come forward here. I would like to pray with you right here, right now. Please be so kind. Come down from the top. Come here forward. Please come. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Praise God, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Come, just come. Amen. This day is your day of salvation. Praise God, look at this, look at this. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. There's power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Can we sing that? that are here in front I want to congratulate you this is the greatest decision you've ever made in your life because right now you will pass as the Bible says from death to life and from the power of Satan to God which means you change territory you leave that old rotten world and enter into the kingdom of God New laws are there, and Jesus is there. And he said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, we read in Romans, shall be saved. We will now call upon the name of the Lord Jesus in prayer. And that moment, something happens inside of you, and you will know that Jesus has washed and cleansed you. I want everybody to please close their eyes, and repeat this prayer after me loud and clear. And I want everybody to support those who pray it here in front. And pray with all of your heart. Let's pray. Say, Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I'm coming to you just as I am. I've heard that you died for me. I heard that you shed your blood for me. 
I now reach out to you and ask you wash me with your precious blood from all my sins and break every chain in the name of Jesus I put my faith alone in you I believe with my heart what I speak with my mouth Jesus is now my Savior I belong to him he belongs to me in Jesus name amen I bless you 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 in Jesus name Lord fill them with the Holy Spirit I pray fill them with the Holy Spirit in Jesus mighty name let me pray for the sick if you're sick lift, lift your hand Lord look at every hand and all these great needs some are at the door of death in the name of Jesus I rebuke the spirit of death I speak health and life and peace to you and I thank you Jesus that you now heal from cancer you heal from dystrophy muscle dystrophy you heal from multiple sclerosis in the name of Jesus you shall rise up and walk Oh, Lord, I pray that your healing power come over everybody that is sick and let everybody go home free, healed, saved, rejoicingly. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love you very much. Please continue to pray for me as well as I will pray for you. And if God gives grace, we'll meet somewhere in the world. I get the feeling we will meet somewhere in the world. Hallelujah. Give God praise again. Reinhard Bonnke, such a treasure to us in the kingdom of God. I want to remind you, tomorrow's chapel starts at 1030. It's going to be a very special, very special chapel, one of the highlights of the week as we commemorate our 50th anniversary and honor those who have gone before us and have built this university for the glory of God. I'd be remiss tonight to have Daniel Kalinda in the house and not bring him up here and say hello. Would you welcome him again? <laughs> this, this actually is quite unusual that Reinhardt and Daniel are on the same stage these days. Daniel's doing a lot of work in Africa. Reinhardt is traveling across America preaching the gospel. And I want to say tonight, as president of this university, Reinhardt, thank you for the example of passing the baton to a new generation of leader. You've been exemplary in this. It's amazing to me. And Daniel, thank you for stepping up and taking the baton. We're going to see great things in this ministry in the days ahead. The best is yet to come. Give God praise here tonight. Amen. Wow. Come on. Praise him tonight. Daniel, since you're here at our 50th anniversary, would you pray our closing prayer tonight and pray an anointing over this student body to go to the uttermost bounds of the earth, take God's healing power and shine his light. Would you just sort of lift your hands again tonight, receive this prayer, and at the end of Daniel's prayer, you're dismissed for the evening. There's a reception in the lobby. Enjoy your fellowship tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight gathered as your people standing here in your presence 
And Lord, we thank you for the heritage. We thank you for the last 50 years. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in this place and through the lives of so many people that have come through here. But Father, it's not enough. We're asking that you would pour out your spirit on another generation. Lord, that you would let your fire fall again. Lord, that you would fill us up, that you would send us out. Lord, let this school become the incubation chamber for a whole new generation of Holy Spirit evangelists, a living church, a living ministries, serving a living Jesus as living pieces of evidence. Lord, let that fire fall on us right now, I pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, we stretch out our hands. We take it by faith. We receive that anointing. We receive that commission. In Jesus' name, and everybody said a mighty. Amen. Amen.